Hello everyone, good evening. good evening. First of all, thank you for all of you being here to study with us uh, this chapter. And thank you, yes, for the invitation uh, for us to be here facilitating this study today. Uh, so, for the ones who, are, who have not been following along, the good news is a book from Berto de Campos, uh, as Marcelo said, and Chico Xavier. It's a book that is still only in Portuguese, but it's being translated to English. So hopefully you're going to have it for sale uh, in a few months. Hopefully. Let's see. Let's hope. Um, it's, a, it's actually, Humberto was a journalist in Brazil a while ago. Uh, well, a lot of years ago. And uh, Humberto, after this carnage, he came and channeled through Chico 30, uh, these 30 chapters called Good News, uh, among other books where uh, these are stories that Umberto learned in the spiritual realm while he was studying the gospel there. And he brought it to us because it gives like, a, it shines a new light, let's say, from stories that we know from the Bible, sometimes all the stories. And this one is no different. So this one is about the disciples. It's about when Jesus called the disciples and gave their, uh, the first lecture, le lecture for them, explaining to them exactly what they will be doing and what their responsibilities were. But if you see here, uh, even though the book is about the apostles, like the 12 apostles, we, uh, who are also called the disciples, Umberto chose to call it the disciples, not the apostles. And that's a, that makes a, some difference, right? Because we are disciples as well, and we'll be touching a, a little bit about this topic uh, a little bit later. But we can be disciples. There were 12 apostles, but there are many disciples across uh, the history. And we are invited to be disciples as well. So this uh, chapter is a little bit different than other ones that we've been seeing from previous months, because we did study four, uh, four months prior other chapters. Uh, chapters because this one, instead of just having one story end to end that's like a, a bunch of events that happen and Umberto brought it to us, in this one it's actually there are some events, uh, but it's mostly introduction of the, of the apostles and then a message that the, the very first message that G Jesus gave to the apostles, and then a little bit of another event that happened at the end that we can uh, try to understand a little bit better why Umberto tried to uh, put it there. But it's actually a little bit different because we'll be mostly studying one message from Jesus, just like we do in our studies here on Sundays. But it's a very, very deep message that hopefully we'll be uh, trying to understand a little better and bringing it to our lives uh, nowadays. So uh, on, in November, Thelma brought to us uh, in the chapter three about two the apostles. Uh, Peter and three, sorry, Simon, Peter, Andrew, and Levi. We'll be talking about them as well, but like Thelma, if you go to YouTube, you can find this lecture there. Uh, there is a whole story on how Jesus invited these three, uh, Peter, uh, Andrew, and Levi, to join him. In chapter four, last month, Fred told us about James and John, sons of Zebedee. Uh, and now in, in this chapter, we'll be listening about all the other apostles, not really a story on how they were called, but we will like at least introduce them to understand who are they, okay? So uh, just housekeeping, uh, every time you see uh, a text in quotes, italic mode, this comes from the book. So basically we, br uh, we brought here all, almost all the text, 99% like of the text of the chapter. So we'll be reading together. Every time you see uh, in italic, it's from Berto de Campos. Uh, every time it's not italic, it's like from the gospel, from the Bible, some of our thoughts. Okay, so just everyone knows. Uh, so let's start. So uh, Umberto starts the chapter saying, the master frequently gathered a large community of his followers around Cap uh, Capernaum. Many people waited for him along the way, eager to hear his instructive words. Before long, he assembled his small school of disciples. So uh, we want to highlight two different passages, two different uh, small parts of this paragraph here. First, uh, Umberto talks about a large community of his followers. It's, uh, it's funny how it's a chapter about the disciples and actually Umberto starts talking about the crowd, about 
this large community of followers that Jesus had a around him everywhere he, got, he went. But he also mentions that uh, before long, Jesus also assembled this small school of disciples. So here is Umberto giving us two different uh, roles that play out here. One is the crowd, and another one is this small group that follows Jesus, that stays closer to Jesus. Actually, we'll see that in, uh, in Mark, in the book, in the chapter 4, where Mark says, with many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them, to the crowd, so Mark was talking about the crowd here, as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without a par using a parable. But when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. So here, uh, Mark also touches about this difference, right? When Jesus is with the crowd, he, uh, he speaks in parable and he speaks more in, uh, in a general way. But when he's with his disciples, he speaks clearer. He actually gives the message, say, this is how it should be. This is uh, what you should be teaching. And this is what we need to be uh, careful here to analyze, because this chapter is about a message to the disciples. So it's a very clear message. It's a very to the point message that will tell us this is what Jesus uh, meant to tell the disciples at the time. So as we are saying, uh, we have these two different uh, roles, right? These are two paintings, uh, like showcasing the crowd, the disciples here with Jesus. So let's see what the Bible says about the crowd. Uh, in Mark chapter 6, uh, Mark would say that uh, when Jesus landed in, and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. So Jesus would see the crowd, the general population, as uh, sheep without a shepherd, right? Those who are still kind of lost, who are, still need some power, some authority to be guided through uh, the good pathway. While if we go and understand what disciple means, in, even in the dictionary, it means one who accepts and assists in spreading the doctrines of another. So disciples are those who are close, who are close to Jesus, or who still are, and but it's uh, an active role. If you see, it's a, it's accept, it needs acceptation. It needs a work to assist Jesus to sp spread the doctrine of Him, right? So one thing that we need to think here is where are we in this in this role? Which role are we? Are we still in the crowd? Are we still these sheep uh, who need guidance, who are lost and who doesn't have a shepherd? Or have we found our shepherd who is Jesus and we decided to accept and assist Jesus on, the, on spreading the message? So if we put ourselves this evening on uh, the role of the disciple to understand, okay, I am here having the privilege to sit down with Jesus and hear what he's telling us we will understand the message much better because we can foresee our future and understand what, what Jesus needed from us and what he wanted us to do. So let's keep that in mind. So yeah, so uh, before, before we go to, as I said, we have kind of three different parts in this chapter. The first one's introduction to the apostles, just talking uh, about who the apostles were. And then it starts the real, the message that Jesus said down. But before we go to the message, let's understand who the apostles were. Um, so Humberto de Campos say, after one of his preachings about the new kingdom, he called to the two, sorry, he called the twelve companions who, from that time forward, would be the interpreters of his actions and his teachings. They were the most humble and simple men from the lake of Gennesaret. So uh, some interesting parts here. Uh, first, twelve companions. Some scholars of the Bible, uh, they see the number 12 as being very representative. Um, if you go to the Bible and you search for the number 12, you're going to find it in 187 places. So there, are, there is a number 12 all over the place there. And some scholars who, understand the, who, try, who try to understand the culture and why this could, uh, what this could represent, they will say that 12 was a number deliberately chosen by Jesus because it, uh, it meant power and authority at that time. So the number 12 would represent that. 
so what Jesus wanted to, uh, some people uh, think that what Jesus wanted to do here was by choosing a group of 12 people who would uh, help him. He was saying these 12 will be the group that will help those sheep who need the shepherd, who will give the authority and the power that comes from God to guide this crowd to find the good. So by choosing 12 here, some uh, 12 companions here, some uh, scholars think that this is what represents. Jesus uh, wanted to show this other meaning of these, they are representing the power of God. And another thing that Umberto says here is, is that this group were the interpreters of Jesus' actions and teachings. So if you think about uh, inter what interpreter means, uh, imagine that uh, if someone is uh, hearing parrot. They need an interpreter sometimes to understand what, for example, this lecture. If someone uh, would be sitting here, there would be an interpreter like with, uh, let's say, uh, sign language telling them what we, we are telling here, right? Why? Because they have some physical uh, limitation that they couldn't under really understand everything that we'll be saying, and then the interpreter would be this bridge between what we're saying to their understanding. Here, it would be the same thing. Jesus was, uh, Umberto was saying that the Jesus expected the disciples to be this bridge where, uh, from Jesus' teachings and Jesus' uh, example to what the crowd could understand. So the 12 disciples would do this interpretation of Jesus' words and Jesus' actions so that the crowd would get the, the real message of love that Jesus brought. And then um, Umberto goes to introduce the disciples. It's just a one paragraph, very small. He doesn't talk much about the, the apostles. Uh, but let's go one by one here. So remember, it's 12 apostles, right? So he starts with Peter and Andrew. Actually, in the very first sentence, he already introduced five of them. He says, uh, that's the text. Peter, Andrew, and Philip were sons of Bethsaida, from which James and John, descendants of Zebedee, also came. So it's just like, okay, all these came from Bethsaida. Peter, Andrew, and Philip uh, were, were from there. James and John, also from there, were descendants of Zebedee. This is a painting from Caravaggio uh, showing Peter and Andrew and shows Jesus without a beard there. Uh, we know that Peter, from the Bible, uh, Peter is considered to be like the leader. The, it, he had a leadership role. Um, and it, we know from the Bible as well that Peter was the very first disciple to recognize Jesus as Christ. Was the one uh, that when seeing Jesus walking uh, on the water, he went, uh, he threw himself and tried to walk as well because he had faith in Jesus. So Peter was, and it's not, it's not uh, by chance that Umberto introduces Peter here as the first one. Because Peter was this rock that, uh, as we see uh, later on, that Jesus said, you are the rock that I'll build on my church, right? Then we go to Philip, who Umberto says is also a son of Bethsaida. Uh, so Philip was, presented in, was present in some passage in the Bible. Uh, for example, in the wed wedding in Canaan, uh, Philip was the one who went to ask Jesus, how can we feed these 5,000 people? Uh, so Philip had his uh, importance on in several uh, passages of the Bible as well, uh, but Umber Umberto per se doesn't say much about him other than he's, he came from Bethsaida. Okay? Then we have here uh, James, which uh, was also, who was also known as James the Greater, and John, again, from Bethsaida, sons of uh, Zebedee. We, we heard uh, Fred talking about them in the previous chapter, right? Uh, just one thing is that James is called James the Greater. It doesn't mean that because James was more important than others or anything like that. The Greater here, it just means he was taller, he was older than the other James, which is who is James the Less. Uh, so he was James the Greater, the other ones are James the Less. Uh, but it doesn't mean anything other than that, according to the scholars, okay? Uh, and John, by the Christian tradition, John is uh, known as the John the Evangelist. So, uh, and both were sons of Zebedee. And here we have uh, Levi, who is also known as Matthew. So even like if you see uh, this paint is called Saint Matthew and the Angel, because uh, that's uh, he, how he's more known. Uh, Thaddeus, 
And these, these are the names that Umberto uses in the chapter. But for example, Tadeus, his name was Judas Tadeus. But so that they, uh, you are, he's not confused with the other Judas, uh, Umberto calls him Tadeus here. And then Apostle James, uh, who was son, all of them sons of Ophius. Um, yeah, and this is James the Last. So the other one's James the Greater. This one's James the Last. Younger and shorter than the other James, he got the nickname. Yeah, look so. Yeah, look so in that, right? <laughs> yeah, that's true. But uh, maybe it was not very representative. And of course, like these paintings were how the painters thought about them, right? Like there were there were no selfies at the time, so that we you can't really know how they look like. So here, are Thomas, uh, Thomas in in the Latin language, and Bartholomew. So uh, we know that what, what uh, Umberto says that Thomas was a descendant of old fishermen from Dalmanutha, and Bartholomew was born into a hard-working family in Cana of Galilee. So that's what, again, like Umberto brings them, okay, they came from that city, they are sons of that person, and then let the rest, like let the stories speak by themselves, right? We know that Tom, uh, Thomas here uh, was called Downing Thomas because he didn't try, he didn't believe that Jesus had risen from the dead until he saw it. Uh, so we we know that story about him. And Bartholomew, we know that he was introduced to Jesus by Philip, by the other Philip that we just saw. So Philip met him, and then he introduced to Jesus. Jesus called him to be a disciple. And then we have Simon, later called the Zealot, and this is what uh, Umberto says. So Simon, later called the Zealot, left his home in Canaan to devote himself to, to fishing, so he was also a fisherman. Um, we were starting to understand why the Zealot, and actually there are a lot of discussions among the scholars uh, on why Simon's called the Zealot. So the Zealots were a group of uh, Jews, uh, they say nationalistic Jews, sometimes bordering fanatical, who were actively sought independence from Roman rule. But zealot also means that say, someone is zealous with something, right? With religion, for example. So some scholars think that Simon was part of this group. Some think that uh, Simon was just zealous about his religion. And that's why he was called zealot. They re don't really know. It doesn't matter. He was there. He was with Christ. He was working with Christ. Uh, but it's interesting that Umberto brought up this topic, saying Simon was also called the Zealot. And then we have Judas Iscariot, the one who is the most difficult one to find paintings about him that do not show betrayal or him being angry. It's so sad. <laughs> so like, uh, but it's here, like I, I found one, I found two, there is another one later on. Uh, but Judas, uh, about Judas, it's funny because what Umberto says is that only one of them, Judas, was different from the others because he was born in Iscariot. He devoted himself to a small business in Capernaum, Capernaum where he sold uh, fish and trinkets. So uh, remember, like people didn't have surnames at that time, like chosen surnames. They would be like, uh, this is Diego, son of this person, or Diego from this city. Uh, same thing here, like when we hear that Judas Iscariot, it just means, uh, some, most people think it comes from Ish Cariot, which is a man from Cariot. And actually Cariot is uh, this city over here. There's a laser pointing. Okay, in the, in the middle. Awesome, okay. So Cariot is around here. So, uh, and all the others, if you remember, Umberto has been saying like, Oh, these came from Capernaum, this came from this city, from that city. When you plot on the, the map, all the other uh, 11 disciples came from here. And Judas is the only one who came from here. That's why uh, Umberto says Judas was different from the others. Not because of uh, anything else for now, but because he came from here which when we go to study about the cities and the culture at the time, we start seeing that actually the culture here is much different than the culture here. So a man who was born and raised here and then moved all the way up here uh, will have different values perhaps than um, a group who is born and raised here, right? Uh, but that's all what they say. It's just Judas, was, Judas Cariot was from Cariot here and then he moved here to start working. He opened a business, and then he was called to follow Jesus as a disciple. 
And then uh, Umberto says, in the beginning, the Messiah's small group of companions had some difficulty agreeing amongst themselves. Conflicts arose and took them apart. From time to time, the master would encounter them in their useless discussions about who would be the greatest mm -hmm. in the kingdom of God. Other times, he would find them talking about who among them had more knowledge about the gospel. So you see, um, I think it's very important that Umberto showed here right after introducing the apostles because like sometimes we have this idea that the apostles are all oh, these you know like elevated men who were following Jesus actually no they they were prepared of course and they had some preparation in the spiritual realm I believe but here we can see that actually they had their problems they had their flaws remember they wanted someone who uh, according to Umberto who was the interpreter of Jesus so he wanted also someone who was also close to the crowd, not someone who's up there like Jesus were, uh, like Jesus was. And they had their problems, they have their conflicts. If you see here uh, in the Bible, Luke in chapter 21 said, a dispute also arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. In Mark, Mark said, they came to Capernaum when he was in the house, he asked them, he being Jesus. What were you arguing, uh, arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. <laughs> so they were like, try to hide from Jesus saying, oh, no, 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 we are not hiding at all. We're not, we're not arguing at all. That's okay, right? Uh, but we can see from the Bible that this was frequent. Like these were two different uh, times, uh, like two different stories in the Bible. And it was still present the fact that the disciples used to argue about silly things. Like who was the greatest amongst them? Or who was the one who knew more about the gospel, who loved Christ more? Right? Uh, so they, they were human beings. They were uh, prepared for the job. They were there uh, act, uh, making some effort. But they were human beings. And they were following Jesus and helping him, okay? So uh, Umberto continues saying, Levi, Matthew, continued his work as a tax collector and Judas kept his small business, but they would get together with the other's companion, Delis. So Levi and Judas Iscariot, uh, they, they were, weren't with the group all the time, like the others were. They were working. Levi is still a tax collector. If you remember this from Thelma's uh, uh, lecture, this is uh, again from Caravaggio. It's a painting where Jesus it depicts Jesus calling Levi, here Levi collecting taxes, uh, and Jesus go there and ask Levi, and Levi just says, uh, "Master, I'm ready." Right, and he goes with Jesus. Uh, but Levi kept doing that. He kept his job. Judas kept his business and he was working there all day. But what Umberto says here is that they would get together with the other 10 uh, disciples every day. So they would still go there and having these lessons and learning with Jesus. Uh, and Umberto goes on saying the other 10 were almost always with Jesus near the transparent waters of the Tiberias as though they were participating in a celebration of constant illumination. Imagine that you are in a group, a close group, uh, with Jesus every day, all the time. And of course it's a celebration of a constant illumination because it's, you are learning with Jesus, you're receiving that energy that comes from Jesus. And you are, and you are there working with him, seeing him doing all, uh, all the blessings and everything that he does. If nowadays, more than 2,000 years later, we read about this passage and we feel like how good they were and the energy that comes from these letters, imagine being there with Jesus every day, all the time, uh, understanding and participating with him. So it's uh, on that environment, like knowing the, the, the apostles, and knowing that they were with Jesus, that we go to the second part, which is Jesus' initial guidance to the apostles. So Umberto starts saying, when it was time to start actively spreading the new doctrine, the master gathered the 12 apostles in the house of Simon Peter, and he gave them the first instructions for the great apostolate. So uh, here there are a few passages uh, that are interesting, right? First, it's the house of Simon Peter. Again, remember, Simon Peter was the first one who uh, recognized Jesus as Christ. 
And he was the one who Jesus uh, said, upon, yourself, upon you uh, it will be built about my church, right? So by starting the apostolate, uh, by the first uh, teachings at the house of Simon Peter, we understand that this is very significant because like, it means that the church was starting there. It was like all 12 gathering in, the ho in that house starting what would be the doctrine that we still learn and, and try to learn and try to understand and try to incorporate to our lives nowadays. So this is a very important passage that we need to understand. It's the message that Jesus started at all. Like it was the very first act of these uh, 2,000 plus years that we've been studying uh, since then. Uh, and again, like the first instructions for the great apostolate. It's, it was like the very first instructions where Jesus uh, put everyone together and say, okay, now that you were hired, let's go on and give the employees book, right? Like what, what will you expect uh, from here? And here is a painting of uh, Simon Peter, like uh, with the, the keys of heaven as uh, some religions believe and the Bible representing uh, the religion. Okay, so uh, first lesson, and then uh, what, what Umberto says, right? According to Matthew's narrative, so Umberto starts the, the, the lesson with this, and, uh, and why is that? Because in Matthew chapter 10, there is a summary of these, uh, and I am saying summary, like nobody, nobody says that in the Bible, but this is a summary of the, this lesson, right? If you read this chapter, if you go to chapter 10, you will see that Matthew actually describes this message, and it's just, it's just that Umberto comes here and gives more, shines more light in different passages, like he expands what Jesus uh, said. Uh, so let's go to Matthew first, and then we come back here. So Matthew said, Jesus called his 12 disciples to him, and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. They are the, these are the names of the 12 apostles, so Matthew lists everyone, and they, these 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions, and then it starts the message. What Umberto says that, according to Matthew's narrative, the initial guidance by the Messiah explained the course of action that the disciples would follow in order to fulfill their responsibilities. And that's exactly that. Uh, we're going to see that the messages that Jesus passed were actually just like a checklist saying, okay, this is what you need to do, and this is what's going to happen to you, so that's how you should behave, that's how, how you should act, because that's uh, the job, basically. That's what's expected from you. And remember, these were, this was a message for, for the apostles, but actually the chapter is called the disciples. So it's a message for ourselves as well. So let's uh, read all these messages and we're gonna show paragraph by paragraph and we'll be discussing about them uh, because it, it, we need to apply that in our lives nowadays, right? And this is a very rich message. We have time, if you want, like in any paragraph, touch your heart or you want to say something, just raise your hand and then we can discuss a, a, a little bit more about that, okay? Otherwise, we will be following along with how Umberto said that Jesus uh, taught them. So, who wants to read for us? Who can read for us? I can read. Yeah, okay, thank you. The Lord Jesus told, told them with extreme, extreme mildness, You shall not take the wide road where everyone walks, led by easy and shallow interest. Instead, you shall seek the rough and narrow road of sacrifice for the good of everyone. Thank you. So yeah, so um, here Jesus starts mild, right? Like beloved. So it's just like, okay, as if the message will be just very simple. Let's sit here and talk, beloved. You should not take the white road. So it's, uh, and again, we remember that from uh, the gospel, right? Uh, we, should, we should not take the white road because it will not be an easy path. The road will be uh, rough and narrow. And he says a road of sacrifice. So we need to understand that it will, uh, Jesus starts the lesson saying it won't be easy. You are not here to play, right? We are here to do an important, an important job. So uh, let's not take the white road. The one that the crowd follows, the one that everyone follows. Let's sacrifice ourselves and let's take the rough road, but that's the right one to take, right? 
And if you go to the Gospel according to Spiritism in the chapter 18, that's what they say. They say the door to salvation is narrow because those who want to go through it must make a great effort to control themselves in order to overcome their evil tendencies and few resign themselves to do so. So again, it's just the gospel bringing uh, in, different, in a different way what Jesus taught in the very beginning. The door is uh, narrow because people don't want to make this effort, this sacrifice to improve themselves, to control themselves, to overcome the, their tendencies. And then what happens is that uh, everyone goes one way and uh, we, if we're following Jesus, we need to go to the rough path, the one that not everyone goes, but it's the right one, the one that will lead us to actually uh, fulfill our responsibilities uh, according to God's will. Who else wants to read? Yeah. Thank you. Also, do not get involved in futile discussions as the Samaritans do, in disagreements that are counterproductive to sincere efforts to establish the true kingdom in the hearts of men. First of all, search for sheep that got lost from our Father's house. Search for the ones in distress and those who voluntarily exile themselves from His divine love. Gather with you everyone who has an anguished heart and tell them that I said that the kingdom of God has arrived. Thank you. So yeah, so uh, first Jesus started talking about the future discussions, the ones that we saw that happened, Umberto told us they were, they were happening, right? So Jesus wasn't trying to hide, oh, you are my perfect group. No, no, he was telling them, hey, stop these discussions, like, it is counterproductive. We have a work to do, we have something that we want to done here, and then it's counterproductive to be discussing, to be arguing with one another, try to understand who is the better, who is the best, who, is, who understands more about the gospel, who follows me more or less, right? So Jesus was alerting them, uh, we have an important job to do in front of us. Let's stop the future uh, discussions and let's search for the sheep that got lost. If you remember from Luke, this is a, these are the ones in the crowd, the ones who, the sheep who Jesus uh, had compassion to, uh, from, that got lost from our fathers. And now uh, he was telling the disciples, go there and find this sheep because they got lost and they need to be brought back. But it's very important to understand that Jesus was saying that we voluntarily exile ourselves from, the love, from God's love. So it's not that we got lost because, we, uh, because of God's will or anything. It's because we voluntarily exiled ourselves from that, from that love. So it's Jesus here uh, teaching about uh, the free will, teaching about how each one has a time and each one has the, the will to maybe exile themselves, getting farther from God, but they need at some point, they will feel this need to come back. To, feel, uh, to be found again, and these were the 12 who would be found and who could be there for these volunt who voluntarily exiled uh, with anguished heart to find again the kingdom of God. So it's an extremely consoling message. It's Jesus telling them, go find the ones who are suffering because they exiled themselves and bring them back to the kingdom of God. Tell them that I, I told you that the kingdom of God has arrived. So they, their time arrived again if they are happy, if you are ready for that. And then he goes on, work, for the, work to heal the sick, to cleanse the lepers, to raise those who are dead in the shadows of crime or in the ungrateful delusions of the world. Enlighten all spirits who are in darkness, giving freely of what you have been freely granted. So remember, Jesus would heal the sick. He, would wa he wanted the disciples to do the same, the apostles to do the same. The disciples not always were able to do that. And Jesus would say, because you don't have faith. So Jesus was here since the very beginning telling them, hey, go heal the sick, because that's your job as well. Uh, go rise those who are dead in the shadows of crime and go bring them back, right? But give freely what you are freely given. If we uh, bring it nowadays, what we have here is the gospel according to Spiritism again, talking about mediumship. And they say God does not sell the granted benefits. 
why then would someone who is not even the benefits distributor and who cannot guarantee the obtainment demand payment for a request that might not be answered? So here is the gospel telling us two things. First, it's not our, like we're doing the job, but we are not the distributor of this benefit, right? So it's not ours to, to give or sell or anything. It's ours just to facilitate. The same way here that uh, Jesus say, give freely what you have been freely granted, because he's telling the disciples, you have been granted with this power so that you can help others, but it's not yours. It's just it's been lent to you so that you can go ahead and help others. The same way with Mindyushim here, the gospel tells us, do not try to uh, request payment for something that you are not sure is going to happen, right? Because that's the second point. We, we can try to help, but Jesus would heal someone and say, because your faith uh, healed you, right? So it depends on each one. Uh, being ready to receive that, each one to be uh, to be uh, willing to receive that, so that they would receive. Otherwise, the one who's giving is actually just trying to help, but they can't guarantee anything, right? So, who wants to to read? Right? Do not display gold or silver with your garments, because the kingdom of heaven reserves the most beautiful treasures for the humble. You can read seven. In your path, do not gather superfluous bags, tunics, or shoes, because those who work for their own livelihood are worthy workers. Thank you. So it's Jesus, uh, and then it starts now uh, a series of, paragra of paragraphs of Jesus telling them how to behave, let's say. How to, when, so you are out in the field, you are helping, you are working for God. This is how you should do. And he starts with the appearance, right? Like, do not display gold or silver in your garments because uh, the King of Heaven reserves the most beautiful uh, treasures for the humble. Remember, uh, um, uh, Umberto de Campos said that these were the most simple men of Gennesaret. So it, it was not hard for them, we can imagine, to be simple, to be humble. But Jesus was telling them, maybe you will start, like, the, the power will start rising in your mind, right? And then you, you want to uh, display gold, display silver. Don't, do not do that. This is not what uh, is ex expected from you to do it, right? And then do not gather uh, super superfluous things. Do not get ma gather material things uh, with you along the way. Because the worthy workers are the ones who work for their own livelihood, are the ones who are working to help another, to help themselves, to just keep their livelihood, to keep their job, but not actually just accumulating superfluous things, right? And then he, he continues saying, when, enter, when entering any town or village, find out who is searching for the goods of heaven with sincerity and devotion to God, and then share the blessings of the gospel with those who are worthy until you live. So, uh, if you remember from the parable of the sower, Jesus says that there are four different types of soils, right? And here what he's saying, uh, we believe, He's saying, go find the ones whose soil is already ready to receive the, uh, the seed to let it grow, right? Because uh, remember, this uh, is a message for, 12, for those group of 12 to start the, uh, the spreading of the doctrine. So Jesus wanted them to be there, uh, finding the ones who were already ready and searching for the goods of heaven so that they could multiply uh, that message, they could multiply uh, the lessons that Jesus wa was giving them. So it, uh, he goes here and says, okay, go to the towns, find those who are searching for that, searching, thirsty for, that, uh, for these words, and give it to them. Share the blessings of the gospel of those who are worthy until you live. Worthy here meaning the, the worthy workers that Jesus talked uh, about in the previous slide, uh, the ones who are uh, ready and willing to receive and spread the message, to become disciples as well. Even nowadays, it's the same thing. Like, remember, Jesus is not saying here, like, go and convince people uh, to come with you. No, go there and find the ones who are uh, searching for it, right? So, when entering a home, greet all with love. If this household deserves the blessings of your dedication, embrace it with your peace. But if the home is not worthy, 
return that same peace to your hearts. In Matthew, uh, remember chapter 10 is all this message in a, a shorter way. Uh, Matthew says, if the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it's not, let your peace return to you. So it's Jesus saying, again, like, do not go there. First, go, go to a house and bring love to those who live there. Bring, bring love everywhere you go. But second, if the household deserves the blessings, I mean, if the household members are ready to receive the message, go there and leave the peace of the gospel with them. But if not, do not argue, do not discuss, do not try to convince them, do not try to tell them that you are right and they are wrong and, you know. No, just return the same peace to your hearts or let your peace return to you. Let the gospel return to you because we're going to go there again, right? When they're ready. It's Jesus uh, teaching them about how each one of us have a different time to receive this message. Even nowadays, we can't go outside and be arguing with people and we'll be trying to force them to believe in what we believe because maybe what we believe is not even what they need to believe at that time, right? So we need to let uh, leave the peace with them if they are ready for that or let the, bring the peace back with us to another house that we're going to greet with love when uh, we find a house that's ready. But then you ask, okay, what happens if there is no ready house? And Jesus actually talks about that. If nobody receives you or does not wish to hear your guidance, just leave shaking the dust from your feet. That is, live without holding any grudge and without becoming tainted by the iniquity of others. So if you go there and nobody wants to, uh, to is, is searching for it, nobody is trying to understand my message, that's okay, just live. But leave, do not bring anything with you. Do not bring any bad energy with you. Just shake the, the dust from your feet and do not hold any grudge. Because there will be other houses, there will be other people uh, looking and searching for the, for the love of God at this moment. This is not the moment to argue. This is not the moment to try to convince people. It's their moment to find the ones who are ready and to translate, to interpret the message to them. And then if you go to uh, the Gospel according to Spiritism, Erastus in, in, the mens in the chapter 20, he talks about uh, some, some related to that. So he says, of course you will speak to individuals who will not want to listen to the voice of God. Wasted words I know, but what does it matter? You must water with your sweat the ground that you must sow, for it will not produce a crop accepted through repeated efforts of the evangelical hoe and plow, go forth and proclaim. So it's the Rastos telling us, yes, there will be people who don't want to hear about this. There will be people that you go there and try to proclaim and teach them about the, the lesson, and they will not be ready to listen. But what does it matter? Just keep walking, keep going forward, right? Do not leave there shaking the dust from your feet. Do not hold grudge against them. Go on and go forth and proclaim, because they will be ready one day. So, in fact, and this is Jesus continuing, in fact, I tell you that a day will come in which there will be less rigidity for the great sinners than for those who seek God with false belief on their lips and without sincerity in their heart. For this reason, I'm sending you as sheep into the wolves' den, and I recommend that you act with the simplicity of doves and the prudence of snakes. So this is a very, very deep message. So first, it's Jesus saying, "I'm sending you as sheep into the wolves' den." So it's it's not it's not easy, right? Like it's Jesus alerting them. It won't be easy. It's it will not be a piece of cake, right? Uh, but still act with simplicity. Keep, your, keep your, you being simple, keep your, your essence as the doves do, but be prudent as well, right? Don't, don't be silly, don't, uh, don't let them fool you. Go there and actually uh, try to understand, try to search the ones who are sincere, who really want to understand and to gather this message, bring it to their lives. 
That's why he says, uh, for those who seek God with false belief on their lips and without sincerity in their heart, uh, they will, there will be rigid uh, bu uh, punition, punitives. Uh, because this is not the way to do, right? Do, they do not try to fool you. So be prudent, but be simple. Try to remember that. Who wants to read this one? However, our brothers and sisters, beware of some people, because you'll be delivered to their cause, and you'll be beaten in their magnificent temples from which the idea of God has been exiled. You'll be led as defendants to the presence of governors and kings, of tyrants and unbelievers, in order to testify about my cause. Thank you. Joana de Andrews in the book Happy Life, he, uh, she says that as well. She says, uh, it's not because you were working for the good that everything will be, will be happy and everything will be uh, simple. No, it will be actually the opposite because there are spirits who will try to stop you. And the same thing here, there are people who will try to stop you, who will call you to be the fun and uh, to testify about my cause. But if we go to the way, the truth and the life, uh, chapter 71, I think it's one of the most uh, beautiful messages uh, from this book, from Emmanuel. Emmanuel says, when the master invites someone to take part in his endeavor, it's not so that the person may weep in discouragement or lie around in idle contentment. If the master has called you, remember that he already considers you worthy of being a witness. So what, what Emmanuel is saying here is that if you are, called, if you are led as defendant in order to testify about the Jesus cause, it's because Jesus, already, Jesus and everyone around you already identifies you as being a witness, as like you witnessed what happened and you are understanding what's going on and you are being called uh, to testify about that. That's a good thing. It means that you got the message, you saw the fact happening and you are now being uh, called to testify. So this is a master telling you, if you do your job right, you will be identified as someone who has witnessed what's going on, who witnessed the, the world changing, right? And then he goes on, however, in the days of painful humiliation, do not be anxious about what you have to say, because my word will be with you, and you will be inspired by the words that you shall speak. Because it is not me, I'm sorry, it's not we who are talking, but the loving spirit of our Father who speaks through all of us. So it's Jesus consoling them as well, saying, I know it will be hard, I know you'll be hurt, but do not be anxious, because Jesus, I'll be with you, and you will speak through uh, the God's, uh, God will speak through you, our Father uh, speaks through you. It's like Paul saying to the Galatians, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. So it's Jesus giving us this consolation saying it will be hard, there will be hard times in the days of painful humiliation but we will be there and you will be helped because you are working for a, great, a greater cause than any of these that's happening. So it's very consoling. And then he goes on, in, on those dark days in which you will fight in this world for my name, a brother will deliver his own brother to death a father will turn against his children, thus spreading the sinister trail of the wolves of the iniquity along the pathways. So it's again Jesus alerting them what's going to happen. And we do study this in the Gospel according to Spiritism. If we go to the chapter 23 uh, called uh, Strange Morals, uh, the spirits that talk there about why Jesus said that he was not bringing the peace, that he was bringing the sword, that brothers would fight with brothers, father would be against these children. And the spirits explain that, in my opinion, uh, in a very simple way. They say, these words of Jesus must be understood as referring to the rage that his doctrine would provoke, the momentous conflicts that would be its consequence, the battles that would have to be born before it was established. He was like the doctor who comes to heal, but the whole, uh, whose medicine provokes a healthy, healthful crisis in removing the ills of the patient. So is, these are the spirits explaining. Jesus was talking about that and telling that this would happen because 
he would be misunderstood. And people who understood him, uh, people who misunderstood him would have this rage and the doctrine would provoke that. But it's okay. It's like a doctor who comes and brings the, bring the, the medicine and it has uh, the, the counter uh, indications. How is it? Yeah, thank you. Counter effects. Uh, but this is okay because this is healing you and at the end it will bring the peace, it will bring the love in its full uh, measure, right? But Jesus had to alert them that this was, this was going to happen. And then he goes on, those who follow me will be despised and hated because of me, but those who persevere until the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one city, move to another. I tell you that in reality you will never be alone because my thoughts will always follow you. So Jesus starts here on the uh, more consolation phase. He was already saying, okay, I'll be with you, the God's words will go through you, you, know, we, you will know what to do. And here he goes on saying, you will not be alone because my thoughts will be connected to you. And of course, nowadays we understand that this is uh, up to us, right? Each one of us can be connected to the good spirits if we want to, if we prepare ourselves, if we take care of ourselves to do so. Uh, but Jesus is saying here, like, if you persevere until the end, you will be saved. So there is a light in the end of the tunnel. So keep going on, keep going forth, as Erasmus says, because there is something at the end for you, right? And then he says, if you undergo suffering, take into consideration that I also came to earth to give testimony and the disciple is not more than the master, nor is a servant more than his Lord. If the enemy of the light gathers temptations, jeers, ridicule and cruelty against me, what won't he do to my disciples? And this is just like uh, getting us to be humble, right? Like we start suffering and then we compare ourselves to what Jesus went through and we think, yes, like what I'm, what I'm going through right now is nothing to com compare to what they did to Jesus. And that's what he's saying, like we are not more than the master. If they did that to Jesus, what they would do with us? So be aware that this can happen, this will happen, and, uh, and this suffering comes from a good cause. It shows us that we are in, a, in the right path. Uh, Emmanuel says in one of the, in the chapter 82 of The Way, The Truth and the Life as well, that uh, what should we expect in our turn in that beings that we are, symbolic, is still dry branches of the tree of life. So he, he compares us with a tree, and we are just this dry branch of the tree, while they are there, like uh, hurting the main tree, the branch, when we are suffering the consequence. But we are just like a small part of all this big doctrine that Jesus was starting here. And then he goes on. However, be aware that our Father is above everything. Therefore, it's not necessary to be afraid, because one day the whole truth will be revealed and the good will triumph. Go on and go and openly spread everything that I'm teaching you in private, because everything that you hear now will be the subject of your preaching from the rooftops. Wow, right? So our Father is above everything. It's not necessary to be afraid. Don't be afraid. You are learning here, and now you go out the door and go and proclaim it from the rooftops. Because that's what needs to be done. That's the job. So it's Jesus ending the message here, alerting them that their main, job, their main job is to proclaim to those sheep who are lost, to those who are seeking uh, God's love again. Uh, and we see that in the Bible, where in Luke, they, uh, Jesus said, no one lights a lamp and hides it under a bush, in a bush or puts it on the bed. Instead, they put it on a stand so that who, those who come in can see the light, right? So Jesus was saying, like, you are receiving the light. At this moment was Jesus passing the light to these 12 disciples and telling them, go on and do not hide it. Do not put it under the bed. Do not try to, uh, to keep it to yourself. No, go to the rooftops and show the light to everyone who are willing to see, everyone who have their eyes opening, opened, because that's what we should be doing. And then he says, Work for the kingdom of God and do not fear those who kill the body because they cannot annihilate the soul. 
Rather, be afraid of the malignant feelings that plunge the body and soul in the hell of conscience. Don't people sell to birds for a farthing? Farthing was just like a small, something of a small amount, of small value. However, none of them fall from their nests without the will of our Father. Even the hairs on our heads are numbered. Thus, do not be afraid, because a man or a woman is worthier than a lot of birds. Right? So it's Jesus saying, be afraid of the malignant feelings that plunge your conscience. So nowadays with spiritism, we understand that the conscience is the one that holds uh, God's laws. So when Jesus, what Jesus is saying here is that when we understand and we uh, observe our conscience and notice that the conscience is the one that's hurting, that's when we should be afraid. Because that's the time that we know we are, we are doing something that's uh, hurting God's laws. It doesn't come from outside, it comes from inside. And this is what uh, these feelings uh, are the ones that we should be careful and we should watch to understand uh, what we should be uh, changing ourselves. And, and he says that uh, like any bird is uh, taken care of by the Father, any hair is counted by God, so why wouldn't we be important as well if we are most, much more valuable than birds and the hairs? So God is also looking at us, God is also watching us and giving us guidance. And then he finished the message saying, devote yourselves to the love of the gospel. Any of you who acknowledge me before humankind will also be acknowledged by me to my Father who is in heaven. So he finishes uh, asking them, devote yourselves to the love of the gospel. So this was the end of the message where Jesus was asking them, uh, bring love to others, bring the gospel to others and devote your love to uh, yourself, to the love of the gospel. And then Roberto says that uh, the instructions by Jesus were heard for some time. When he was done with his speech, the expression on everyone's face was one of joy and profound hope. The apostles wanted to contemplate the future of the glorious gospel of the kingdom. They trembled due, due to the joy of their hearts. So imagine, like, we, we are reading the book now, we are reading Umberto's view of what happened that night. And we end this message and we, uh, our hearts are pounding with the love that we feel coming from this message. Imagine being there in that room among 13 people, being, one being Jesus, and Jesus talking to them about this. The, the, uh, it's the opportunity to view ahead of them what, what was going on. What would the kingdom of God would bring to them? What their job, their role on this kingdom would be to differentiate themselves from the crowd? And nowadays it's still the same. We are reading these and trying to understand what can we do to differentiate ourselves from the crowd. So joy and profound hope, I think, it's just like very small description of, of what the disciples should be feeling at that time, should have been feeling at that time, right? They were, and Umberto says, they were trembling though to the joy of their hearts. With that, we go to the last part of the paragraph, where uh, we are calling here Judas' concern. So it, uh, it, it's funny to think, and I'd like to hear your thoughts at the end about this, why, why Umberto didn't stop the chapter at that part. So, it was like introduction of the apostles and then uh, the message, very powerful message and that, like it's a crescendo, right? Like we are listening that and feeling that, all that. And then it comes uh, what happened right after the message. So Umberto says, There was when Judas Iscariot, before all of his companions, as if awakening from those deep emotions of enchantment, came forward to the Messiah and declared in firm but respectful terms. Lord, your plans are right and valuable. However, it is reasonable to consider that we cannot build anything without any financial contributions. So it's Judas there with the 12, uh, quickly awakening from that moment and say, uh, I have a comment. It's uh, like your plans are right, your plans are valuable, but we cannot build anything without financial contributions. What about, where is the money? You didn't talk about the money. You said like, 
let's not bring gold, let's not bring silver, let's not accumulate super, superfluous thing, things. But how can we do that, right? So uh, it, it hints to us, uh, we think, that Judas hasn't got the message quite right here, right? Like, uh, Judas was still in that mindset that we see all the way down until uh, what the moment that's called the betrayal, that Judas had this idea that Jesus was there to build a physical kingdom. And here, that's what he says, like, we cannot build anything without financial contributions. So uh, Jesus was awakening everyone in that, like, joy uh, that they were feeling to say, hey, uh, we did money, Lord. And what Jesus would do, right? What we would do if we were Jesus at this moment? We would probably would be angry, would probably yell or something. But no, of course Jesus wouldn't do that. So what Umberto says that Jesus say, Jesus looked at uh, Judas serenely and replied, Did God need precarious uh, wealth to create the beauties of the world? Money is a, is, is a useful tool if it's not on the hand of someone who can master it. But, oh, sorry, if it's on the hand of, the, of someone who can master it. But we would never be everything, because love, with its infinite resources, is above all perishable treasures. So Jesus uh, didn't admonish uh, Judas to say, oh, don't, don't talk about money now, right? No, 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 he was saying, yeah, like, first he, he, he gave the lesson, like, what did, what, did God need money for to build all that? Of course not. But money is a useful tool. If you can master it, if you can master and control the money that you have, it is a useful tool. But it will not be everything, because love is everything. So be careful there. But Umberto says, in the middle of the general surprise, because probably they were also like uh, laughing at Judas and expecting Judas, uh, J Jesus to say something, Jesus continued after pause. Judas, in, sp in spite of the fact that I don't have any money in this world, I cannot ignore the first suggestion by those who will help me to build the kingdom of my father in the souls of men. Put into practice your proposal, but be careful regarding the temptations of material possessions. Organize the financial contributions and keep them with you. However, never look for things that exceed the necessary. So Jesus was saying, okay, this was the very first uh, thing that came up in this group. I will take it, right? I cannot ignore the fact that you think like that. You are part of the 12 and you are bringing me a problem that might be real. Right? You will need money to travel and to, uh, and to go to the cities. So he started doing, putting practice what you said. Uh, but be careful regarding the temptation of the possessions, right? Never look for things that exceed the necessary, only collect the necessary. So uh, Umberto says that right there, under the pretext of the need to encourage the initial movement for the great cause, the son of Iscariot, uh, Judas, uh, took the first collection from among the disciples. So Judas uh, got up and collected money from the, the other disciples. Everyone's contributions were minimal, but a few modest coins were attentively collected by Judas. The master watched the implementation of that first step with apprehensive smile, while Judas carefully put away the modest fruits that were collected. Then, presenting Jesus the little purse, small enough to be lost in the folds of his robe, he exclaimed satisfied. So Judas uh, showed Jesus the, the, the small uh, bag with the coins and said, Lord, the bag is tiny, but it consists of the first step for us to be able to accomplish something. So Judas was assuming that mindset of this is how we will start. Like, it's not with love, it's with these coins that are here, right? And Jesus serenely looked at him, according to Umberto, and prophetically replied, Yes, Judas, the bag is tiny. However, may God will that you never succumb to its weight. Which we know later on, that's exactly what happened with Judas, right? Uh, so was Jesus alerting him, hey, like, get out of this mindset that you need money for everything here. Love is bigger than anything. You need love. You don't need, the, you don't need this money. But okay. And actually, we see from the Bible that Judas Iscariot was the treasurer of the group. So he kept doing that job of collecting the treasures and understanding uh, and having the finances in order for that group. 
But this is how Umberto ends the chapter. It's not with the message, it's with these other uh, teachings of may God will that you never succumb to its weight, to the money's weight. So after you hear all that message and you hear uh, this message, we think that w there are some questions that we should bring up to ourselves, right? Not, not to like anyone respond right now, but we should like go back to the book and uh, reread this uh, when it's available. And also to understand uh, how this applies to our life. Are we choosing to be the, on the disciple or are we choosing to stay in the crowd, right? Where are we right now? Are you in the crowd, the, sh the lost sheep without a shepherd? Or we are trying to be this shepherd who is guiding this lost sheep uh, towards Jesus? Are we choosing to be the interpreters of Jesus' teachings? Are we, are, are we the bridge between what we learn here at the center, what we learn at the gospel, and bring it to everyone in our day-to-day -day lives? Not imposing it at them, but trying to uh, seek those out who are, uh, who are looking for Jesus, who are looking for God's love, to be brought back to a religion, to be brought back to love, to peace. Are we working to spread Jesus' teachings? Are we getting too caught up with practicalities? Because that's what Judas was doing, right? Judas heard all the message, everyone was joyful and everyone was very uh, reflective about what happened. And Judas, he raised his hand and said, hey, I have like a practical question here, like how are we going to do it, right? And or are we succumbing to the monies or the privileged weights? Because every one of us are privileged for being here, for understanding the gospel, for understanding Jesus, uh, Jesus' teachings. But are we succumbing to this money, to this weight of the weights that are pulling down, the, the material things that pull us down sometimes? Are we succumbing for that? And finally, let's remember uh, about G what Jesus said to Peter and Andrew when he called Peter and Andrew to follow him. Follow me and I'll make you fishes of men. So let us all try to follow Jesus, try to get out of the crowned mindset and actually become a disciple and they start being fishers of men. Try to find those uh, who are there, lost, and bring them back to the love of Jesus. Thank you.